Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I'm Jayo, co board chair of uh, KoreanAmericanStory.org. We are here to celebrate this exhibition, Han in Town. Now, I would like to introduce tonight's panelist, Janice Chung, who is right here, is Janice is a Korean American photographer born and raised in New York City. Through her work, Chung amplifies and deconstructs her Korean American identity by capturing moments that are deeply personal. In doing so, she hopes to shed light on the intricate details of immigrant and di diasporic life where, while straddling the two places she calls home, that is New York and Korea. Chung earned her BFA in photography at the School of Visual Arts and is currently based in Queens, New York. And sitting right next to Je Janice is Peter Song Jr who was also born in Flushing and raised in the same neighborhood where his family business, Shoe Village, is located. His dad started the business in the late 70s as a street peddler in Brownsville, while his mom was a nurse at Rikers. Peter initially started out in IT before joining his dad and brother in the shoe business in 2002. And Peter currently lives in Whitestone with his wife and two children. Welcome, Peter. Jinglan K. Kwan is Korean Chinese from Yanbian, Korean Autonomous Prefecture in Northeast China. She and her parents have run Northern Wangmandu since 2017, where they celebrate food from the Yanbian Prefecture, a unique blend of Korean and Chinese flavors. Through their family business, she hopes to share the food from her hometown and be a bridge between the two cultures. And she is here with her children as well. So welcome, Kay. And Ikwan Rim is a proud New Yorker and a third generation juror, gemologist, and owner of Im's Jewelry, located on Union Street. From early 2010 to 2015, he intermittently became the vice president of the Korean Association of Greater New York and formed the Union Street Small Business Association. Currently, he serves as the vice president of the Queen's Korean Association, as well as the vice president of public relations for the Korean American Chamber of Commerce. He's a very busy man. <laughs> Ikwan connects daily with tens of thousands of Korean Americans in the tri-state area through his radio shows on 87.7 FM radio, Korean radio broadcasting station. So welcome, Ikwan. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so I want to start the discussion with Janice. So this wonderful project that you call Han in Town, um, why did you decide to do this project? And what was sort of the inspiration or the theme behind it when you started? Um, yeah, so Huntingtown started because I am from Queens. I'm born and raised from Queens. Um, and Flushing was always super dear to my heart because you know I have family in Flushing. I, my parents took us shopping to Flushing constantly. I grew up kind of adjacent to Flushing. Fresh Meadows, College Point. And so for me, when um, at this point in my life, I felt like I kind of wanted to do a homage to this place that I grew up a part of. I, I noticed that so many of these businesses that have been in business from my childhood, they started to disappear. And I felt like if I don't do this project now in five to 10 years, like maybe some of these businesses are, are, aren't going to be gone. And even as I was photographing, I noticed that there were businesses that uh, I had asked to be photographed and they had said no. And then two months later, six months later, they disappeared. Um, some of these business owners are no longer owning the shops that I photographed them in. So things are constantly changing and flushing. The demographics of flushing are changing. And um, I wanted to, it's my love letter basically to my, the generation of my parents. And my parents also uh, used to own a deli. 
So I could really relate to, when I see these shopkeepers, like I think about my family, I think about my parents, and um, yeah, that's why I really wanted to photograph Flushing. So you said it's a love letter to Flushing. Yes. But was there any specific things you wanted to highlight? Um, anything that you thought maybe people really didn't know about or misunderstood about Flushing? Or something that you really wanted to share about this community? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I think I've always personally been interested in getting to know the lives intimately of these business uh, owners. And um, I, my personality is a little bit on the shyer end, so I could never uh, sort of walk up to these businesses like out of the blue and be like, hey, like, well, how's it going? And, you know, and kind of have conversation. But putting myself, like forcing myself to do this project, it kind of forced me to get to know these people, forced myself uh, to introduce myself and you know many of these business owners don't speak English I don't really speak Korean that well and so there was that kind of language barrier which made it very difficult and so personally I just yeah really wanted to get to know them and despite the language barriers I felt like it needed to be done and I wanted to share these stories with um, my friends and my the community and I think a lot of people as they were chatting with me today they were saying oh like uh, these business owners, these businesses, uh, they bring me so much nostalgia. And I also have so much nostalgia for this community and this neighborhood. And so, yeah. So was that the biggest challenge, sort of knocking on their door and yes. trying to talk them into? Yes. Um, there was some haggling. There, I had to convince many business owners, begging them, using a little bit of egg yolk here and there sometimes. <laughs> Um, you know, sometimes I had to go to some businesses like five or six times and like by that five or six time, they're like, okay, fine. And we're so sick of you coming, just like photograph us already. Um, but some of them like really understood like the, the meaning of the project and what I wanted to highlight, like their, their stories and their sacrifice and their immigrant journey. And, and a lot of them kind of understood right away. So I, it, was, it was a mix for sure. And we have the three people you are managed. You managed to convince. Yes. Um, so I wanted to ask each one of you, um, what was it like when Janice came knocking on your door and asked to photograph you, and why did you decide to be part of this project? Why don't we start with you, Peter? Um, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm naturally an introvert like Janice too, but. Retail changed that. <laughs> you have to deal with a lot of people. But um, uh, in terms of the idea of the project, uh, there was no hesitation. It was more of a hesitation of, I guess, me, my family were more of a more private, not very much like out there type of people. But the project itself was so same, close to home. I mean, we're kindred spirits in that we were both born in Flushing Hospital. <laughs> we share that, but just having someone like have a nostalgia and also an appreciation for Flushing as their hometown, like that's, that's exactly how I feel the same way. So for me, that was a no brainer. And Kay, you're the one who did not grow up in Flushing, but you've been living here. Um, so why did you decide to become part of this project? Uh, when I saw her on the street, first of all, I like her. I don't know why, but I just like her in the first, when I first time saw her. And then she just explained to me, oh, what's she going to do? Take some pictures and do some like a project. And I said, okay. Then I think, I'm not grow up in a flushing. I just do the business in a flushing. I live in here. I live like almost like 15 years. Then when she mentioned, you know, what, what she want to do something project for the flushing, that I want to part of this community, and I want to part of the, you know, uh, part of this project, and I want to support her. <laughs> me for me is more like personal. I like her, so I just want to support her. <laughs> What's not to like about Janice? So. How about you, Iquan? Why did you decide well, to participate? Uh, yeah, like Peter, I, there was no hesitation. Uh, the thing is that like, I've been in the same location for like 20, almost 20 something years. And I see a lot of, um, it's like 20, maybe 30 years ago, you know, Union Street was like, everybody was in Korean. It's like Korean stores, like maybe like 90%, but now maybe 10%, 15% are Korean. So we, you know, there was like, um, 
it's like one block of Union Street, like between 37 and it's like half block because the other is residential. Half block of Union Street, there were, are like 100 businesses, literally 100 businesses, and they're like 90 businesses were Korean before. Now you could just pick. So, you know, I appreciate that, you know, it's like the Korean business built a like downtown Flushing a long time before, and nobody knew about it. If what only these archives could like know that, like, like that's like a picture tells us, wow, there was a Korean store there. You know, I think it's part of history that she's um, archiving. And it was like, I was so grateful too. And thank you very much. And I hope, you know, this legacy could continues. And, you know, maybe my son look at it, oh, my store is there, you know, the other store is there, you know, I mean, it's part of history. So, I mean, keeping a part of history is what we really need to do. And, you know, she's doing it right now. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. But speaking of history, um, both Peter and Iquan, you two, um, it's a family business, right? Your parents started this business and now you are running it. So I wanted to ask you two what it was like to grow up watching your parents running small business and what was that like and what made you to get into the family business? Um, so why don't we start with you, Peter? Yeah, I mean, as most immigrant families, right? Most immigrant kids were somewhat of a, like latchkey kids, right? So like my memories are mostly my dad not being there actually, just like working, right? But as an immigrant kid, you grew up understanding that it's a necessity. Right, so like you, you just know that he's working there. My mom was able to, uh, thank God, over time my dad's business was doing well, so she was able to be there for us at home. But um, yeah, my memory is just him being busy at work because our original store was in Brooklyn, in Brownsville, it's still there. So like uh, he was able to uh, start doing business in Flushing with the warehouse, and then he came closer. So I remember like being in the basement and there's like toys and things like that. Um, at that time, it was uh, the transition to shoes. And uh, after college, after working, uh, I went to school in Buffalo and I just thought, you know, my dad worked so hard, um, it would be kind of like messed up <laughs> if I didn't give it a shot, that sort of thing, right? And it turned from that into found lost time working with them, getting to know each other, getting to work with them closely, getting to understand the business and learn it. And it was fun, you know? So it, it really, I thank God it worked out in a good way for me in that way. Um, you know, it's got its ups and downs, right? Family business is tough. So, you know, like older generation, newer generation, you're gonna have your clashes. You could, I'm sure everyone here can imagine <laughs> what that could be like, or you've, you've worked and you've, you've understood that and you're like, hell no, I'm out of here. I'm gonna be a professional, right? <laughs> so like, uh, but in the end, that was, yeah, the, the transition for me. How about you, Iquan? What was it like for you? Well, uh, my father came to state 1980 and um, he got a green card in 1984, and 1985. As soon as he got a green card, uh, our family moved into New York. But before that, my grandfather used to have a, a jewelry store. It's like a, a factory. My fa like Since I was really, really young, that I don't remember, uh, we had a jewelry store. And, you know, it was a little different because at the time in Korea, like, we had, like, factory. But when I came back, well, he had like very small, it's like by himself. So after school, sometimes he, I had to work with him at night, like high school, like, you know, it's like dolbanji, right? It's like my father was one who made dolbanji in the US, I think. <laughs> it's like, you know, it was hammering. So we have to like polish it. I really didn't like it. <laughs> it was pretty hard, you know? Yeah. So 
after college, I went to state, uh, North Carolina State. After that, I told my father that, well, I want to be a pilot. So, <laughs> so I, when I, was, I applied for Diamond University. And my father goes, well, you know, before you go there, I go to like gemology school. And then why don't you go back? Do whatever you want to do. Well, after that, I, I got a job. It was like, you know, as a gemologist. And then <laughs> naturally, I took over. And um, yeah, like Peter said, you know, family business, especially your father, it's not a fun job. It's like, you know, you're constantly fighting. Oh, why you have to do this? And you're like, this is the old way. Well, this is a new way, but, but you know what? Um, I don't know. It, it was it just all the experience I had was was great, and I'm so proud that you know I took over my father's business now, and I hope my son took over my my business. You know, like fourth generation will be very cool. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It's like uh, you see, he talked me onto it. It's like he's like, why don't you go to Jamal just go first and then do it? But since I know everything, since when I was young, it was like still natural. After that, it's like. My father like, oh, you go to me you go to me It's like, oh, okay. And then it's like, <laughs> that's it, you know, yeah. So he was training you in a sense. Oh, yes, yes, like a dog. He's like, well, yeah, you go to me you go to me <laughs> But Kay, you started your business after moving to the States. Um, why and how did you start the Northern Wang Mandu? Uh, like around seven years ago, my mom used to work there. And the owner, or owner was, you know, mom's, you know, one of kinds of like a hometown friends, you know, they know each other. And the mom just worked there, help her to, you know, because my, my, my parents was run a, a restaurant business back, you know, around like 20 years when he was in China. So she had no problem working there and she loved to make food, you know. And uh, my that I call her aunt, the old owner I call her aunt. And the she, Imo, and the she, just to have like a healthy issue, so she wanted going back and she wanted to retire. So mom said, okay, how about we take over? Take over the business. Cause she she can she used to make the recipes with the aunt, you know, emo together. So my family, my parents want to take over the business. But at the time, I'm not really want to do it because I know I saw my parents, you know, restaurant business is really hard. You know, long hours, so much things we have to take care of it. So I don't want to do that. But I remember my parents they told me, because my parents, they like feeding the people. It's not just making the food. They like feeding the people. So they want to make a good food, you know. Uh, back then, it was cheap and good quality, you know. And plus, the dumpling, king dumpling, is like handmade. You know, so that's for me is really cool things, you know. So they they want to, you know, take over the business and then, back, and then I think maybe I can keep doing that too, you know, keep that good transition how to make the dumpling skin with the hand. And uh, she wanted to feed the people. Then when I, back then I was be, I'm the mom of two kids. Then I can feel it's feel good, to, you know, feeding the people, you know. So okay, let's doing it, you know. So for now, it's you know, it's been like five, six years now. So I think we're doing great. So all the employees, you know, we all think like, okay, in our mind is like we're not just do the business, just make a dumpling. We kind of like all made our heart and the feeding the people. So we always talk about that, you know, feeding the people. So yeah, that's that's the things you know on a business. That's wonderful. But also, what is it like running a business in Flushing as a Chinese Korean? Do people think that they're gonna get Chinese food, or do they think <laughs> yes. that they're gonna get Korean food? Yes. What is that like? Yeah, just like I said, some people they walk in, see, because uh, all my employees they Chinese, they speak Chinese. They say, "Oh, this is Chinese place," you know. They just they turn around, and just leave, you know. <laughs> uh, some people they because they they are afraid to you know communication with the people. How how they gonna order the food, you know? Even they have menus on the top. But that just take time. It takes take time. That's happen in the beginning of the business, you know. So that's it's my things. I used to work in the counter all the time that I explained to them, you know. 
So it's really big benefit to me is I can speak both language and both, I have both culture and I know what's the, uh, whatever Chinese people or Korean people, they like, they need, they want. So it's pretty cool and they, for me it's really good benefit and uh, you know, now all my employees, even Chinese, now they can speak a little Korean too. <laughs> yeah, they say, 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 something like that. So it's really a fun thing, a cool thing. Yeah, so it seems like you're so navigating this whole two culture or actually three culture thing, because it's Chinese, Korean, and American culture all at the same time pretty smoothly. But did you expect that to happen when you came to the States, that you'll be straddling all these different cultures all at the same time? Uh, no. Uh, before, I was afraid. How I, I, I asked myself who I am, you know, how I can explain to, you know, explain other people who I am, you know. Uh, but now, because before I have to explain to them, Oh, this food, whatever I run a business, it's Chinese, Korean, and this I mix it up the other recipe, and this I explain to that. But now, I'm more focused. I'm not focused on me, you know, who I am. I just more focus on the food, you know. So, so make the good food, make the good dumpling. Then it doesn't. The people not really care about the who made it, you know. So all focus on the food. Me personal, I'm not. You know, I'm happy now. I find myself to you know feel good. Then before, feel like I'm lost. I don't know how to explain to 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 other people what I make and uh, who I am. But now, yes, now I, I'm 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 pretty you know proud of myself or feel good myself to you know make it a good food. I just people more focus on the food, not beside who made it. Yeah. That's great. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, Peter, um, you talked about your father having the business and then you go, went into the business with your father and your brother, I believe. Um, what did you learn from your father's experience what, by watching him and learning from him? And if there's anything you're trying to do differently, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, I learned a lot. Um, I mean, there's, there's, he's had a lot of experiences. So like when he came to the States, I mean, he was trained as an architect in Korea. So when he came over, he started to work as a draftsman. Um, but he had me and my brother and soon realized that a draftsman salary at that time was not gonna cut it. So he got a peddler stand on Pickin Avenue in Brownsville and he was working selling wigs. So like uh, he, one story he tells me is when he realized the rules of the street. So like he, a woman grabbed a wig, ran, ran off, he chased her down, came back, everything's gone, right? <laughs> so, so what he did was, you know, as a Korean man in a predominantly black neighborhood, he had to learn how to befriend and learn the culture and really connect on a heart to heart level because he couldn't do it with language at the time. So he learned to soul shake, you know, give pounds, just really try to connect. And when I saw him working at the store in Brooklyn, uh, I would see that. And there would be generations of people who would come in and they would recognize him because he'd be on the bullhorn on a Saturday, busy street, just yelling people to come on inside. And my grandfather would do the same when he came in to visit from Korea. So I learned how to just really learn how to deal and connect with people. And he... on. He eventually started to do wholesale. So we used to import and wholesale, and he used to design his own shoes for ladies. And we would, he would uh, speak to them, try to get info from them. And for my wholesale base, we would have a whole breadth of different cultures and people. And so if it was a Chinese customer, he would greet them, ni hao, right? Just sing ni hao right? Like, how's business? Just if it's a Jewish customer, right? Manesh ma. Like, I learned phrases through him dealing with these people um, and different cultures. So I really adopted that into my being as a business person. I mean, growing up in Flushing and having the store now in Flushing, 
like, yes, it was an epicenter of Korean culture, but it keeps evolving, right? So we have such a variety of different cultures in one location, and it's amazing, you know? So to be able to have a store here and to be able to be a welcoming place for anybody, that's like, that's a key thing for me, you know? So not to have anyone feel excluded or um, anything like that. Yeah, so I've learned a lot from him. How about you, Iquan? Is there anything that you're do, trying to do differently from your father? Or are, are you... Well, I'll try a lot. <laughs> it's like, father, no, no, that's not the way. It's like, well, well, I think it's like jewelry, especially like dolbanji, like, you know, like 24 karat gold. That's our like long time specialty. And, you know, it's evolved a lot, you know, and now I use like 3D printers to print the jewelries. And, you know, I have a website, rimsjewelry.com. And <laughs> well, and then, well, that, it's like, it's so funny that at pandemic, right, I kind of boost, uh, our sales boosted at the pandemic because, you know, like, you know, Dol, which is like your your child children's first birthday or hundredth birthday. It's a tradition that you, you give out Dol Bans, like 24K baby ring, right? It's just at the pandemic, every store is closed in the United States. Everything, but my website was running <laughs> and I got an order. I was like, oh my God, should I close it? Oh, well, wait, it's just like a lot of orders. Mm, let's make it. But my employee didn't want to work because of the pandemic. So I have to shut my stores down and I have to work myself. Just, just. Well, after that, you know, people kind of knew my website a little bit more because, you know, oh, where'd you get that? You know, it's like, oh, I got it from the website. And then it was kind of evolved like this. And then, but, you know, all the tools that we use right now is from my father. That I cannot use that tool. I cannot make that tool. Because I it's like you have to bend like, you know, like stainless steels, a lot of different things, tools. And every time I see the tools, I see my father all the time. And and you know, I mean, you know, it's like every time I work at the store, I see my father all the time. And, you know, I wish I could pass it on the tools to my son and you know. But, you know, it's it's evolving and and all the stores, I mean, now all the like restaurants too, you know, I see on Union Street, they have, you know, those uh, DoorDash and, you know, and it's, it keep the, keep the business flowing because if you see downtown flushing right now, oh yeah, it's like you want to park, it's like good luck, you know, it's just pretty hard, very hard. And that's why a lot of businesses, especially Korean business, moving out to downtown flushing because, you know, it's hard to park. So... I mean, I'm still there, but you know, I had to find a different way to do business because people didn't want to. There's no parking, and if you go to downtown Flushing, sometimes it's like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you get stuck in the downtown Flushing. So they didn't want to come. So I made a website. I ship it out, and this is very convenient. So it just I have to keep like regular customers keep coming back. So I mean, that's how I, I evolved. And the 3D printers, you know. If you know, I mean, this is like happening everywhere, but it's hard to f find a working person. It's just really hard. I mean, every business, every company needs staff, and they're on the staff. They need staff. They're looking for staff. So jewelry too, you know, like you have to, you know, it's like experienced jewelers, but you know, it's hard to find. So I had a 3D printer. I just print the damn stuff now. <laughs> Easier, so, you know. So I mean, that's how I I got more involved, evolve as a as a, a jewelry store. Yeah, evolving while you're also keeping the tradition alive. It sounds yes, like yes. so. So Janice, I want to come back to you uh, regarding this series. Um, what you have? How many shop owners did you photograph for the project? Um, I would say between like 30 to 35, yeah. Was there anything that completely surprised you while you were working on it or was it pretty much what you expected? Or I guess I should ask, what were you expecting when you first started and what surprised you while you were working on it? 
Um, I guess I was surprised at how much these people really ended up wanting to share their stories. Um, you know, initially there was a lot of reservations about participating in this project. Like, you know, in Flushing, there's a lot of people who like go around and like selling kimchi and like, you know, people who are just selling things. So they just, a lot of these owners, they thought, oh, she's just like one of those people who are trying to sell me something. And they're suspicious of me, even though I don't think I look suspicious, but people were, you know, confused by my project. Um, but once I started talking to them and they started to get to know that, okay, she's not out for my money. Um, they, they opened up to me and, you know, uh, some of these businesses, um, they would spend, they would say to me, like, before we begin, like, okay, we only have five minutes to do this interview, so hurry up. But then it ended up, some of, but then we end up talking for, like, an hour or so, and, um, you know, they, I think these owners really enjoyed, kind of, even though they say they don't want to be photographed, they, they say they want to just, they don't want people to know about them, they end up uh, really enjoying sharing their sh story with me. Um, and I think that was, I think it was just such a great way uh, for me to connect with them and for them to connect with someone younger. And um, I hope that when the owners look at their pictures that they feel a sense of pride. Um, and some of, some of these owners, they say like, oh, my shop is like dirty, old, like why would anybody care? Um, but like all my friends today, they say that, they know all these businesses, they, they've seen all these businesses and how much it means for them to see them and how much it brings back memories for them. So I hope the owners, you know, seeing their pictures, they can, uh, they realize that this is really meaningful for the community and for, for the younger generation and for the future. Yeah, and remembering all these places, as Iquan mentioned before, and recording that they were here. Um, and I know this is kind of like asking you to choose your favorite child, mm -hmm. but if there is one image that really means something to you, mm -hmm. what would that be and why? Hmm. Super hard. Um, I don't know. Each of these experiences were so special and unique. But the one shop that I keep going back to is like probably the cleaners. The, this, this shop is on Union Street. Um, it's called Crystal Cleaners. And this specific Ajishi, like, he was so opposed to being a part of my project. Like, he kept yelling at me, like, get out. Like, I don't want you to. Well, he didn't say get out, but like, no, like, no way. Like, my shop is so old. Like, why would anyone care? But. You know, one day I came with a bag of like ture juru bang, and then he, and then his wife was like, "Just do it. Like it's it's no one, you know, it's fine." And so, so that was really special that he, you know, he finally, you know, ended up doing this project. And I think it was hopefully rewarding for him, like to be a part of this project, and hopefully, like he'll see these pictures and realize like it means something for people, and um, people do care. So. That's great. So Dula Juru always work, works somehow. Um, then I want to ask all of you, to Peter, Kay, and Iquan, we just went through this sort of the ridiculous time period, as you, Iquan, you mentioned, uh, of the pandemic. We're still in it. Um, it's not quite over yet. Um, flushing, as you all mentioned, it's always evolving, always changing. Um, so where do you see your future in Flushing? And how, where do you, what do you see for your business in the future? Uh, yeah, I mean, our business has been affected, interestingly, where um, because of the shortages of merchandise, uh, a lot of these brands, like over the years, we've always been labeled as partners. So like what happened is because of the shortages and actually even be prior to that uh, with the internet and you know, we, we sell on Amazon too and people's habits have shifted, right? So everyone buys more things online naturally. It's easier, it's faster, convenient. So we've adapted to with a website too, shoebills.com, right? <laughs> and and uh, but what's happened is that these brands have start to close accounts for a lot of independents. And we've been hit by that too from certain brands. So 
they have less inventory, they need to, I mean, as a business person, I get it. You got to sell directly. You have a limited supply. You got to make as much as you can from what you're selling. But because of that, you know, it's been happening. Like Home Depot, who is, founder is Arthur Blank from Flushing, <laughs> right? That killed a lot of the hardware stores. Amazon has killed a lot of a small mom and pops for many different industries. So that's an ad adaptation that we've had to kind of deal with. And, you know, how we deal with that is, you know, thank God our community here, you know, one of the reasons why we've, we've been successful and survived is um, a lot of immigrants. And we make it an, an environment where it's easy to communicate in the native language, whether it be Korean, Chinese, or Spanish. And uh, so that, that's what we'll continue to do so. But we need people to come through the doors, right? So uh, we are in the process of figuring out different business ideas in order to do so. So there are things in the plans. I'm not going to say now, but we are I'm in the process of to kind of answer your question before. I didn't answer it in a new way to attack and approach the business. Um, going to add a business to the store. We have a big space, and it's going to be something that's going to be great for the community, great for kids, um, something that will positively affect our neighborhood and the surrounding greater of this part of Queens. So. And we're all looking forward to that. How about you, Kay? What do you think of your business? Uh, over the pandemic, uh, like our business, uh, of course, it get hard too because the people can get out of the house. They don't want. They can't come to the store. Before, like if dump the big bands like in Mandu, we only sell for the fresh one. We made it, just steam it, and sell it right away. The place. But over the pandemic, the people look for like a frozen dumpling and a frozen buns. So then I think about, okay, how we can do it the best way to keep the fresh buns to, to frozen it and even, um, even re reheat it and recook it and uh, we can, you know, it still don't taste the same. You know, so now we we work on it for over the pandemic. Now now we sell for like frozen buns and uh, frozen dumplings, and also in the future I want to uh, show the people more people for the young generation who are interested in how to make the skin and the buns, because the buns skin and dumpling skin are totally different. You know, different protein, different in the recipes. So in the future, if I have chance, I want to show more people of the how to make the dumpling. You know, so that is my plan for in the future. You know, of course, the, the main thing is I want to show, you know, people more of the handmade dumpling and the handmade buns. Yeah, sounds fun. How about you, Ikwan? Well. <sighs> It's just it's just pretty hard for me to say this, but you know, I mean, we do need to. It's like a lot of Korean business in downtown Flushing, like it's moving out from downtown Flushing. It's like Bayside, you know, Murray Street to Bayside, I mean, going like a little more for the further east side, because you know, first will be like downtown Flushing is just parking issues, the transportation issues. It's so hard, um, and there's no uh, there's no answers. It's like you know, like big buildings, you know, like flushing commons and you know, phase two, and now like parking lot is gone. But they're rebuilding right now. But it's, it's parking issues, and you know, like small businesses, you cannot survive like without a parking for maybe three month, four month, because you know rent is is getting higher and higher. Um, you know, it's excess of the customers are. A, you know, is having difficulty. I mean, it's like, you don't want to come, it's like, since I have a jewelry store, it's a little better, but let's say you have a bakery and where like kind of restaurant, I mean, you cannot park. The only way to go there is just that uh, you have to pay like, like a private parking lot, right? Or public, public transportation in, you know, summer or winter, is when you're cold, you don't want to go there, you know? So it's, 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 it's taking a toll. Um, and another problem will be, you know, for us is finding a staff, you know, I mean, our business are growing. I mean, it got better, but it's hard to find a skillful people 
It's like, I think it's everywhere, same thing. I don't know how, where everybody's gone. Everybody's gone. But it's just that I need to move out. And um, I'm trend, doing a transition of more um, doing, like, not handmade, but, you know, like, 3D printers, more machineries that replace um, skillful person. And that's what I'm getting at. And, yes, um, of course, for me, it's just that I need to do more on websites. Like, you know, more, I need to do, like, a lot of different, like, Facebook, Instagram, you know, eBay, <laughs> Etsy. I mean, that's, that's how I think, because it's going to evolve eventually, because it's more convenient, easier. And before, you know, like, like jewelry, it's like, oh, you got to look at the jewelry before you buy. You know, like, you want to see it, touch it. But now it's just so easier and convenient. You just take, 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 look, take a look at the pictures and you know videos, bearing videos, and they buy. They buy diamonds, a lot of diamonds, <laughs> over over internet. It's like ten thousand dollars. Yeah, they buy. So, well, that's supposed to be. I think that's the future and future of Korean business too. It's like because Union Street used most of them like mom and papa stores, you know and. I see a lot of businesses going out of business because it's, it's hard to do that, that transition. It's like internet, handphone, it's like if they can't even access to cell phones and everything. So I see a lot of you know, businesses going out of business. I tried a website, I, I made a website for them as a Union Street. E Union Street, if you go there, it's like, it's like we're shopping mall, but it wasn't just successful because you need, you need the follow ups all the time, but they couldn't do it. So I feel really bad, but you know, but you know, we cannot just cry and it's like, oh, business is like that. I mean, we need to evolve. And I mean, ten years ago was different pictures than that one, like in the Union Street, because most of them like are Korean stores, but now now there's not. At least we got this, and you know, we should archive our. Uh, it's like I just it's like you know, our like. First generations, you know, and I mean, I mean, that's that's like that's. I feel really bad because you know, I had to see a lot of people go out of business. You know, I've, I've been doing saying hello for like ten years, twenty years, and they're gone. You know, one day they're gone. So I, you know, I just few of us left, and you know, at least we got the pictures in archives. No. Who they were there, you know? Yeah, Thank you'll you. have the memories. Yes. So I'm going to open up to the audience. Um, so if you have any questions for any of our panelists, you can raise your hand. And um, yes. expect rent. So the pressure 
Russia must be tremendous. And thank you. Yeah, and speaking of which, I think that's an interesting question too. When you finally did decide to go into the business, was there any, I mean, Equine, it sounds like your father really, really wanted you to go into the business, but how about you, Peter? Was there any, um, any sort of resentment, not resentment, um, any, any pushback from your father saying, oh, you should become a professional, you shouldn't get into this business or anything like that, or? Oh, no, he, he loved it. <laughs> that, that's what he, exactly what he wanted. You know, like, uh, you know, I was originally choosing between Buffalo and uh, St. John's, and uh, he offered an apartment, a car, and I was like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> so, like, first chance for him to get me back in the, to get into the business, you know, he definitely wanted me to come along. Um, so there was, yeah. That, that's been his MO, definitely, from the get-go. To, to your point, sir, like, um, you know, fortunately, it, it is a lot of work. You know, it definitely, you know, for me, I, I didn't really honestly think <laughs> too deeply into it, understanding how much work it is to uh, be a small business owner. Um, but, you know, thank Thankfully, you know, my dad, with his hard work, he was able to uh, own our building. So, like, that, we are our own landlord in that respect. So that it's helped shoulder the burden of the pandemic. Um, but that's a, that's a big problem right now in New York City. Like, I see both sides. As a small business owner operating out of our own building, 40, 50 years ago, like, if you're, in that, if you're fortunate enough to be in that situation, you're good, right? You're good. Now, no, like, so when we moved into the building in, in Flushing, um, that was 16, 17 years ago, the property tax for a single building at that time was 20 grand a, month, a year, right? Right now it's over 100. So we're talking 15 years, that type of percentage. So those landlords, they have to pass it on. They're burdened by that. So right now we're operating, but we're just chugging along. We're paying our bills, keeping it moving. Surviving is winning right now, right? But unfortunately, a lot of people, they can't um, have that same fate, you know, with, with, with these things piled up um, and all these other bills that pile up. It's very, very difficult. And I'm very empathetic towards that, too. It's really, it's, it's like, it's a very tough situation, you know? Yeah. So the first question is, what is the biggest challenge of running your own small business? Uh, for us, the biggest challenge is um, how to see, see what have made a certain amount of the food, right? Like dumplings, buns, then I have to sell that every day, so that, that's like the best, you know, that's our Court. You know, if we can serve it, then I don't know what, how how gonna do with that food. You know, that's the big challenge to us. You know, the employee have to to just sell it as much as we can. And the other things is like, or like we we have good relationship with all the like cause it's a family family business. So I have good relationship with my parents. I have so good relationship with all the employees, like families. So uh, that's that's also is very that's is challenge to us to me to you know how to I keep all the people in the same place you know so why is the sell selling and how to keep my people you know feel to want to be work for me you know that's the things and Ikwan, do you know what happened to all these people who? Closed their shops. Did they retire or did they open well, another place? Like, yeah, I mean, let's say percent. I cannot do like percentage wise, but I know one person who used to do uh, 사랑의 돈가스 
very famous, you know, Tungkase, everybody liked it. Well, they closed down and he is working somebody for somebody else for a whole different field. And I see different like barber shops, like Myungshi, like you know, you know, I mean health salons. Um, some of just move out to Bayside and doesn't own their own business, but sharing with other chairs. So I don't, I mean, some of them just moved out, but let's say 50% isn't quite good. Um, and that's, that's what I, like, I feel so bad, you know? Because when you move out, you don't, it's like, like restaurants and, you know, health salons, like health salons, the structures, like, you know, plumbings and other things, that's, they're, that's very expensive, you know, like, that's like, Quarter, sometimes quarter million dollars just to that, you know, and it's gone. And it's like by yourself outside, and you need that money, but just not a lot of people has it. So, so most of them didn't make it quite well, I bet. So that's pretty bad. Yeah, and you know, challenging for small businesses. Oh, uh, very simple. It's like for me, I mean, for a lot of people, I know it's like rents, 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 rents. Rents are the most difficult thing that small, running a small business. Second will be, uh, now these days, uh, I'm keeping saying again, it's like staff. Especially now, staff is very hard. And um, yeah, those two things are what's most important, thing, important things when you try to do a new business or it's like as a, do a small business, rent and staff, I think. You could have different ideas, but if there's you know, too much rent or understaff, you, you can't succeed. I think we have time for one more question, if you have any. The question is, if you do move out of flushing, or if you have to move, would you miss flush? What would you miss most about the flushing, or do you think you'll miss it? How about you, Peter? Uh, yeah, no, I would definitely miss it. I mean, it's funny you ask that because, like, my idea of retirement is like Hawaii, and I visit I visited Oahu for the first time a couple years ago, and I was like, oh, this is like tropical flushing. You know, so like, so like, yes, I would definitely miss flushing. And it would be, honestly, for me, it's what it is, is, you know, growing up in a flushing that wasn't predominantly Asian. It was a different time. It was a totally different time. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on back then. Um, and as flushing has evolved into what it is, and as, you know, second generations have kind of, felt more at ease being in a community that's just more comfortable in language, food, and culture, right? And assimilated with others, right? Like that's, I would definitely miss that. There's no place like Flushing, really, you know? And I'm a Mets fan, I got <laughs> you know? I want to ask um, Janice the last question. I was wondering what, did flushing mean to you before this project? And I was wondering if it has changed since you've done this project. Yeah, flushing is like home to me. It's like, I don't have a car. I'm one of those weird Queens kids that never learn how to drive. So, you know, going to these businesses, I'm traveling the, there by foot every time I try to hit up these businesses or I'm riding the bus or, whatever. Um, and so um, just uh, walking through these businesses, walking through the neighborhoods, places that I haven't uh, actually walked through since I was a kid makes me feel like, wow, you know, it, it really triggers so much of my childhood. Um, I passed by like the YWCA the other day and I thought, wow, I wish I had 
continued my Korean school there so that I could speak with these business owners. Um, so yeah, Flushing really is home for me. Um, and then what was the second part? Has it changed? Oh, yeah, it definitely has changed. Like, um, I, there's still like remnants of Flushing from my childhood. I, I walked down Roosevelt Ave and there's only like, I noticed like three or four signs left of Union Street from like the 90s or the, even the early 2000s. Like, and some of these businesses, like uh, I don't know if anyone noticed, but there's like old sticker pictures, photo booth pictures, like places like that where I spent so so much time and money. <laughs> I, like now that they're gone, it just you know I I really wish that I had captured these businesses like 10 years ago, but you know. It is what it is. Like I wouldn't have been able to do it 10 years ago, so that's why I'm doing it now. Is this still home for you? It's definitely still home for me. Well, on that note, thank you so much for sharing your stories and your work with everybody. Janice, Peter, Kay, and Yikwan, thank you so much. Um, once again, final thanks to the following organizations, Flushing Town Hall, the Nanum Foundation, and our drink sponsors, Hanmi and Lunar, um, and the, of course, Korean American Story. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.